Okay, hi everybody. Um, oh, I see I'm the host now. Uh, if you have questions, um, feel free to, to either speak up or you can try doing the raise hand thing. Let me see if, whoops. Um, I have to open my chat window if I'm gonna see you raise your hand, I think. Uh, yeah, or just to interrupt. Uh, this can be pretty informal. Uh, so I made, we used to do these talks where they were an hour long and uh, we're doing it shorter this time. So um, I'm still gonna try to give you a little bit of background on how simulations work. I'm you know, not sure what areas uh, or what research all of you might've done earlier on how much you know about molecular simulations. Uh, but I figure I'll talk a little about how those work and then I'm gonna try to put it in the context of one of the projects we're working on the lab right now that has to do with uh, COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus that's um, the causative agent of, of COVID-19. Uh, so I'm gonna give a little bit of intro on the virus and then switch into simulation methods and then switch back to showing how we're using some of those for the virus. Uh, so this picture here is just an overview of the architecture of the virus um, where there's a membrane that um, encapsulates the virus. And on the outside of the membrane are these spike glycoproteins in pink. That's what I'm gonna end up talking about. And then there are some other membrane brown proteins. And on the inside, there's the RNA genome uh, of the virus and then other proteins and things that are on the inside. And so uh, this shows you the life cycle of the virus. And I won't go through all of it because the part that we're really most interested in is this first step. Uh, the viral RNA has to get inside the host cell, uh, which is humans in our case. And so it needs to get that RNA genome inside the host cell. If you don't have a background in biology, normally genomic information like in our cells is DNA. And that DNA that's in the nucleus of your cell gets um, copied into RNA and that messenger RNA is what goes out into the cell and interacts with the ribosome and the ribosome reads off the code on the RNA and then it turns it into proteins. Um, in the case of some viruses like coronaviruses and HIV, uh, the genomic information isn't carried as DNA but it's actually carried as RNA. In HIV, that RNA has to get converted to DNA first before it gets used in the cell, but for coronaviruses, it doesn't. That RNA that's the genomic RNA can go directly to the ribosome and start getting turned into proteins. And uh, it also, later on in the life cycle, um, you need to make copies of that RNA so that you can make new viral particles that all have a copy of their genome. Um, so the goal of the virus in the beginning is just to get its RNA inside the cell, and that starts off this process of making all the proteins and making new viral particles. So how does it do that? Your cells have uh, a cell membrane, a lipid bilayer, and the virus has a membrane that protects and surrounds that RNA. So how is it gonna get its RNA into the cell? And the way that happens is that the two cell membranes need to fuse. So what the virus is going to do is get itself close enough to your cell and try to pull those two membranes next to each other and then that will turn into a single membrane. And so that's what's shown in this picture here, where you see the two separate membranes aren't separate anymore and there's a pore and the RNA can get through in that pore. Another possibility is that the whole virus gets brought inside the cell and then it forms a pore inside there, but that's essentially the same thing for our purposes. So what it needs to do is it needs to attach itself to the cell surface of the right kind of cell and then carry out this process of membrane fusion. If it can't fuse with the cell and get its RNA inside, then nothing can happen and the virus isn't gonna be harmful to you uh, because all of the bad things are gonna happen inside the cell. So the way it does this is by having a fusion protein and that's what the spike protein is on the surface. Uh, lots of viruses have these and so uh, HIV, for example, has fusion proteins that are the, the targets of um, joint discovery efforts. And so the virus is going to try to get these pink spike proteins close enough to a receptor on the surface of the cell. The receptor is called ACE2 in human cells. And it will interact with that and recognize it specifically. And that interaction is going to trigger a series of events that will lead to pulling this membrane close and fusing them together. 
So the spike is very important because that's the trigger. That's like the key that unlocks entry into the host cells. Uh, and so the spike protein is um, the target of your immune system when you develop immunity to, um, to SARS-CoV-2. It's because you have antibody proteins that will bind specifically to the spike and interfere with this process of membrane fusion. Uh, you've probably heard in the news a lot about vaccines being developed for COVID-19, and those vaccines uh, are either spike proteins or um, RNA that will get brought into the cell and make spike proteins. And so what you're trying to do is expose your body to spike proteins in advance when you don't have uh, an active viral infection. And then if it takes your immune system a little while to catch up and develop the antibodies, then it's okay because you don't actually have um, a, an active COVID-19 disease going on. Right now, one of the problems is that by the time your immune system catches up, you've already gotten to be pretty sick. And so the idea of a vaccine would be to train your immune system in advance on whatever the pathogen's gonna be so that it's ready to go as soon as it sees some of it and you don't get sick during the lag period of developing immunity. Uh, and so that's what the, the COVID-19 vaccines are doing is they're trying to expose you to the spike protein in advance. Um, so what we want to do is really try to understand more about how this spike works and how membrane fusion in general works and see if there are ways that we can interfere with it. If we knew enough about the details of how this worked, then we might be able to develop something that would be a smaller molecule than an antibody, something you maybe wouldn't need a vaccine for, but you could just take a pill and it would take care of things. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to really understand more about how this process works so that you can uh, understand where there are opportunities to interfere with it. Um, and so down in the bottom is the host cell membrane in these blocks. And on the top, I'm sorry, down in the bottom is the viral membrane. And this is the spike on it. And I'm showing a series of steps progressing from left to right as the membrane fusion process proceeds. And up on the top is the host cell with its ACE2 receptor that's going to be on your cells. And so the spike is going to bind to that. So here, one of these orange blobs is going to interact with that gray blob, and that's going to trigger a series of events. So this spike is a trimer. That means there's three proteins that come together and form it. And that's why all of these have three pieces. Uh, there are orange pieces, which are the S1 subunit, and then there's these blue pieces that are the S2 subunit. The S1 subunit is the one that's responsible for touching this ACE2 and recognizing it and knowing that that's the right place. And then at some point it dissociates, it, it unbinds from the S2, it leaves, and the S2 is the membrane fusion part of this spike. And so it's going to rearrange, insert itself in the host cell membrane so that those two membranes are attached, and then it's going to somehow bend itself around in the process pull those two membranes close to each other so that they fuse into a single membrane. And so this is great. This is how we think it works, not just for um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, but it's this way for SARS, it's this way for MERS, it's this way for coronaviruses in general. And the problem here is that we can draw this cartoon diagram, but we don't actually know much about what's going on in terms of you know, really high resolution structures that we could use for drug discovery. And so, these ones on the left, we do have some pictures from cryo-electron microscopy that shows us a pretty good view of what the structure looks like. And you can see here that one of these orange ones is kind of ghosted out on these two. There are three of them. Sometimes it's in this position, sometimes it's in an alternate position. And that alternate position is the one that it needs to be in to bind to ACE2. And so we think, based on the experiment, that this moves back and forth on its own. You know, I'll get into that in a couple of slides and try to understand why that happens. That part's moving back and forth. And so over here on the left, we have some structural information. We do have some structural information on what it looks like when it's bound to ACE2. But after that, we don't really know anything. This is just some guesses as to what's happening. And then we do have some information about what happens at the very end, not when it's bound to a membrane like this and they're fused, but what it might look like uh, after it's fused. And so what we want to do with some computer modeling is fill in the details using real atoms and real physics as much as we can so that we know what these arrows look like, what that change in the structure is, and then what these stable intermediate structures look like so that we could try to use them for design work. We can't really do anything 
in terms of structure-based drug design without a structure. And so that leaves you with the way things used to be, which is that you try lots of molecules and hope something works, but you don't really have much of any uh, you know, physics or chemistry-based design going on. It's just random screening. <clears throat> and you'll hear more from people later in the semester about how to actually take uh, structures and screen large libraries with, for example, millions of small molecules and try to find things that might fit and doing that in a computational way before you go off and do the experiments. Uh, so that's the overview of what this process is and all these different steps. Even when we have structures, there are problems because we don't have all of the structure. We have parts of the structure. Anything that's moving and flexible in experiments tends to disappear um, because you're taking a picture of lots of different molecules. In the case of cryo-EM, you use pictures and then all of these different pictures of molecules, you combine them together and make one structure. But if the different molecules are doing different things, then that part of your structure is blurry and you don't know what's going on. And so over here on the left, that's definitely the case where there's lots of blurry parts where we can't see some of the details that we really need to know what's going on. And it's the same over the right where we have lots of the structure, but some of the key pieces are too blurry. And uh, so we need to not only know what these intermediates look like, have some idea what they look like, but we really need detailed views of even the beginning and the end ones. Uh, so that's our goal for the simulations, is to look at these and try to come up with some models and be able to say, what's the mechanism of RBD opening? The RBD is the receptor binding domain. That's this orange loop. Uh, why does it open and close like this? What's it actually doing? And could we stop it? If we knew how to stop that motion, then maybe it wouldn't be able to bind to the ACE2 anymore and would never get inside your cells. Maybe we can't stop it, but we can, sorry, I'm going off. We can stop it from binding to the ACE2 receptor. Maybe we can do that, but we can stop this part of that S1 subunit dissociating. Maybe we can stop some of the things along the way. I'm not gonna go into to these details, but that's what we wanna do is get a picture of this process in detail with all of these dynamic changes going on and we can't get that out of experiments. So we're gonna use computer modeling. Okay, so how do we model uh, a protein like this on the computer or uh, nucleic acids or anything that, that we model? The first thing that we have to ask is how are we going to describe a molecule on the computer? And it seems like, oh, well, you just, you have a molecule. So that's what it is. But we have to make some choices. Um, and those choices aren't really that uh, simple to make. And so there's a couple of quotes that I really like regarding how you represent your system. And the first is a classic one that says, truth is much too complicated to allow anything but approximations. And that's definitely true here we could, even if we knew how to model our system the best way we can, it's going to be too complicated a calculation to do. These systems are too large, too many atoms, too much going on. We can't do it in all the detail that we'd like to. So we have to make approximations. And some of them are pretty extreme approximations. So you might look sometimes at how people are doing like the modeling and say, oh, that's really approximate, but, but that's the only choice we have. Now, the flip side of that is this other quote, essentially all models are wrong or some are useful, but some are useful. So we're gonna make approximations, but we hope in the end still to get a useful model. What's really important to keep in mind is that even though we show these nice pictures and videos and things like that, they are just computer models. And they're there to help guide and interpret experiments. But somebody in the end needs to do an experiment. If I do a computer model and say, well, on the computer model, this is a great drug for COVID-19, that doesn't make any difference unless somebody can actually take it and it works. Um, so these are just models. Okay, so what does our system look like? Well, <coughs> we can model all of the electrons. And uh, for those of you that might have some chemistry or physics background, this is really the best way to represent molecules. We know this works very well. We have all of our electrons, we have orbitals, we have bonds, we can model chemical reactions. Everything is uh, pretty good here, often as good or better than experiments. And so we just need a lot of math that's involved. We have these wave functions and orbitals and so on that I won't get into. The problem is that we can't do this on anything but very small systems. So I could do this on a couple dozen atoms, but I'm not gonna do it on a million atoms for a coronavirus spike. No, you just can't do that. We, our computers aren't good enough for that. So that's out. Another possibility is to say, well, we can't have all the electrons that are involved in the bonds and the reactions and so on, but we're gonna have all of our atoms and we're gonna treat this classically, not quantum mechanically. This is much better. Um, it, the scaling is better, which means as you double the size of your system, it, it doesn't 
um, get slow as fast as the quantum mechanics does. Uh, the drawbacks are that we're not going to be able to do any chemical reactions. We're not going to have any quantum effects like orbitals, electron transfer, and things like that. Uh, but at least we're going to have atoms, and we can have things for those of you, again, with chemistry background. We'll have bonds. We'll have hydrogen bonds. We have things that take up space. We can have water, all of these things we can include. And so this is really where most people uh, do simulations of biomolecules is with all atom detail. Uh, sometimes you want to mix these together, and you might say, well, I'm going to treat most of my molecule with all the atoms, but then I'm going to take part of it like an enzyme, I'm going to take the active site where the chemistry happens and they do quantum mechanics on that part and molecular mechanics, this classical model, on the rest of it. And that can be really useful if you know exactly where the spot is that you need to do the quantum mechanics. It's still pretty slow because part of that system uh, needs to be handled with a lot more complicated math. Um, but you'll see that and that can be done in their papers out there. That's not going to be helpful to us for the coronavirus because we don't even really know exactly where to look to see what the key spots are yet. And it also doesn't really involve much chemistry, so we don't have to worry about that. Another possibility that we are using in this project, but I'm not going to show you anything today, is that we say, well, maybe we don't even need atoms. Maybe we just need beads. These things take up space. They're beads on a string, and um, that can be very helpful when the system gets really large. So if you wanted to model a whole virus or something like that, then it can be helpful just to say, well, maybe every one of your amino acids in the protein is going to be a separate bead. Uh, and so people do things like that. But again, I'm not going to show examples of it. It's just good to know that the basic idea of how you actually draw your system, like every point in your simulation, does it correspond to an electron, an atom, a whole amino acid, a whole a piece of DNA. There's lots of different choices. Okay, so we're going to use an all-atom model. This is an example of a protein here that I've got that's in an all-atom model. And eventually, I want to model the dynamics. I want to know not just the static structure that we get out of experiments, but I want to know how does this thing move around. And in the coronavirus spike, I want to know how does that binding domain move back and forth? How does it change when it, uh, it interacts with an ACE2? And then more important, once it interacts with the ACE2, what are all of those big conformational changes that happen that pull the membranes together? We know they're going on, but we don't know what they are yet. And so we need to be able to model that motion. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by calculating the energy of our molecule. And uh, so if any of you have had chemistry, the way we calculate energies really aren't that complicated. It's the kind of thing that you learn in freshman chemistry we know that there are certain kinds of interactions in our system. This is a big molecule, but when I teach freshman chemistry, uh, I teach them these same interactions just in smaller molecules. We know that there are things like acids and bases. We know that there are things that are polar. We know that there are hydrogen bonds. We know that there are things that are, some atoms are big, some atoms are small. And so we're going to try to include all of those and put in some physics into this model so that we can get out energies that depend on the coordinates of all of our atoms. Um, and so what we do is we calculate the energy using something called a force field. And so what would we put into our force field? And we can just zoom into our molecule and say, okay, we've got all these atoms. They all have mass. And so what are the interactions that need to go into this force field? And so we'll just take a look at some of the parts of the molecule and say, well, what would be going on here from a chemistry point of view? And so we've got to have the atoms connected together with bonds. If we don't have bonds, then there's no molecule. It's just a bunch of dots. They have size. So they've got van der Waals. Uh, spheres. There's electrostatics and salvation. This one here is an amine. It's basic, and so it interacts with water. We've got rotational barriers around bonds, uh, and then we've got some backbone terms. So those are our, our basic terms. We're going to say, you know, based on what we know about chemistry, what's the length of a bond between carbon atoms, two carbon atoms, or between a carbon and a hydrogen atom? These are colored by element. What's the angle here? Again, if you had some chemistry, this is sp3 hybridized, and so those angles are roughly tetrahedral, about 109.5. And so that's the geometry we want to keep. If we don't enforce those angles, then it's not going to look like real chemistry at all. And so all of these things um, are information that we can get about small molecules. We either get them from experiments, like we know from crystallography, what bond lengths are and what angles are and things like that. Or we can get them from calculations that we do that are those high-level quantum mechanics calculations we can't do them on protein, but what we're going to do is we're going to take small pieces and say, let's do them on the piece, calculate lots of really good energies with quantum mechanics, and then we're going to use those as training data. Uh, and so this is our function at the bottom. It's got lots of parameters, different force constants, equilibrium lengths, and so on. 
the, the way the function looks isn't really that important. There are different functions out there, uh, different programs and different groups have different ones, but mostly the function is the same and what varies is the parameters. You know, what are a good set of parameters to go into these? So for example, this one over here, q sub i times q sub j divided by the distance, that's Coulomb's law, which just says for things that have charge, the interaction energy is a product of the charges divided by the distance with some, you know, some factors for units. So we need to know for every one of these atoms, what's the partial charge on the atoms? It depends on their electronegativity, things like that, and there's just some physics that go into it. So if you go to do a protein simulation, when you pick a particular force field, it's going to give you a particular set of partial charges, and then you don't have to worry about it once you're using the software. Uh, but those have to come from somewhere. And this is an example of how my lab develops these. We um, develop force fields for proteins that are used by groups all over the world. And so what I'm showing you here is a single amino acid. This is about the size that we can do a quantum mechanics calculation on. And I'm rotating the side chain. So I'm doing a grid search where you can see I'm rotating really quickly on this outer part and then more slowly on the inner part. I've got two degrees of freedom, two bonds I'm scanning. And then for every one of those snapshots, I am gonna get the energy in a quantum mechanics calculation. And so this is very complicated. This might take me you know, days or weeks to do the calculation. And then I'm gonna get up this energy surface. And then we looked at our old force field and said, well, in the, the classical model, using our existing parameters for those partial charges and all the other stuff, here's what the energy surface looks like. And it's okay because these dark blue ones are low energy. We get the low energy spots right. But when you say, okay, well, this might move around, it might be flexible. And you know, when it moves to these higher energy spots, do you have that right? And no, we really did. These energies are off in the middle where they're too high. So that low energy state is too stable and this molecule was too rigid, too hard to, to get it to change its structure. And so we use this as training data and we do this for all of our parameters. This is just one example. When we go through and we retrain it and now you can see it's not perfect, but it's a much closer match to the quantum mechanics. And so um, those are the kinds of things we use in the simulations where it's trained based on these small molecule training sets. And then we make the assumption that for this amino acid, this is an asparagine. Well, we've got an asparagine by itself if I match the quantum mechanics. Then when I look at an asparagine in a protein and use these same parameters, then I'm getting the essential physics right. And it's a pretty good model, even though I can no longer do the quantum mechanics on the protein. I'm gonna use the simpler model on the protein. And it's not too bad. Okay, so that gives us energy. We've got our molecule here, and this is again really small compared to the kind of things we model, but uh, here's the energy. The energy isn't really useful by itself because it's just a number, minus 23.4 kcals per mole. It doesn't mean anything. What we wanna do is we wanna get out motion. We wanna say, how would this molecule move around during time and when it interacts with other molecules and things like that? And so how do we get that? This is called molecular dynamics. And so what we do is a little Newtonian physics where we say, well, the forces, this is just a force vector, force on an atom I is going to be the derivative of that potential energy function with respect to the coordinates. And it just means if you haven't had this kind of math and physics, as you move that atom I around, how does the energy change? And that makes sense that that's the force. If you move it a little bit, does the energy change a lot? That would be a higher force, or does it not change very much? We also know from Newton that force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration has something to do with time right, how your velocities are changing in time and the velocities are how your coordinates are changing in time. So if we know the forces, which the computer can calculate from that energy function, we can talk about behavior in time. And so we just do an integration, this is a numerical integration, and uh, we take steps in time. We say that the coordinates at time t plus delta t, some little small femtosecond size jump in time, are approximately equal to the coordinates at time t that we had, plus a term related to the velocity, plus a term related to the accelerations and those we can get from the forces. And we just do that over and over and over again, you know, billions of times and as long as we can afford to. And this is why the calculation is expensive, not so much because the force calculation is expensive, it's just we have to take time steps that are 10 to the minus 15th. And if you want to model something that happens biologically on the millisecond or second time scale, you have to take 10 to the 15th of these steps over and over again, and it just adds up and it's computationally demanding. Uh, but that's what we do, and that's how we get out this picture of how this molecule might move around in time. And then on top of this, there's lots of other things that we have in the code. We had in thermostats so that we're doing it at constant temperature. 
baristats so that it's constant pressure. There's many other things we can do, and I'm just going to show you a couple little examples. We can add new things to that energy function, so we can imagine, for example, that you're going to pull on part of your molecule and see how it responds. Now, that's very hard to do in an experiment, but I can easily add an extra force to this function and say, there's a pulling force on this one atom or on a group of atoms. Or I can say, I'm going to kind of put a spring on this atom and tack it down in space so that it can't move very far from that because I want to keep it close to this. And so there's lots of things we can add into that function that make it so we have much more flexibility than you would in an experiment. So the program that, that we helped develop in my lab is called AMBER. Uh, this is actually a couple of years old now. We have an AMBER 2020 and we come out with updates to this every year. There's six different labs that use it. And this is one of the most popular programs for doing simulations of biomolecules. Okay, so is it any good? That's the first thing you should be asking. The function is so approximate, this can't possibly be any good. And, and that's a reasonable thing to think. And so what I'm showing you here for this little protein lysozyme uh, is comparison to experimental data. So we've got in the black line, there's data from experiment. These are called order parameters, and it's related to the flexibility of the backbone. How much motion do you get in the backbone? Low values means it's very flexible. High values means it's very rigid. And then I've got two simulations overlaid on this where we say, well, in the simulation, where exactly is the motion going on in this molecule and compare that to the experiment. And then up in the top is some stuff about secondary structure. So you can see this loop region here is more flexible than the areas around it. And same thing here. And then this loop region is quite flexible compared to everything else. And the simulation does a pretty good job of reproducing the experiment and not just saying, is this a flexible molecule, but exactly where and how much is the flexibility. And that's nice. Now we have that from the experiment. It already told us where the flexibility is, but now what this lets us do is go into the simulation and say, okay, well, what is that motion? Which things are moving? Where? Uh, how, you know, what happens? Why do they move? And there's lots of questions that we can use to help interpret this NMR experiment uh, once we've compared and said we're doing a reasonable job compared to the experiment. Okay, so we want to do this on big systems and long time scales. It gets very expensive. This is a computer that we used to use called Blue Waters. Uh, these are things that are hard to do on small local computers. We definitely don't do these like on, your, on a normal desktop computer. Uh, Blue Waters was huge and took a lot of energy. Um, and we have uh, computers in our lab that we use as well. Um, we used to just use you know regular kinds of computers, but this graph shows you uh, for some, some recent time period, the speed of calculations, what the peak speed is in, in gigaflops, just a measure of calculation speed uh, as a function of time. And these blue lines are CPUs and the green lines are GPUs, which are graphics processing units. So the kind of thing that would run your video game when you're you know, playing a game either on a dedicated machine like a PlayStation or on a computer, there's dedicated hardware that will do all of those calculations for the game, saying where are all the objects moving, what's close to what, did you get hit by that, you know, that bullet or that uh, blaster shot or something like that. We have to do very similar calculations in our molecules. We need to know and track where all these different things are in space, how they're interacting with each other. And so what we were able to do was to rewrite our software, uh, the Amber software. And so instead of needing CPUs, it's able to run on these graphics processors. We use things like NVIDIA GeForce cards and uh, the same kind of card that you would buy for a game, the card thinks you're just running a game on it, but it just happens to be that it's doing these physics calculations for us. Uh, and this is getting to be, as you can see from this graph, getting to be much, much faster than on CPUs. Uh, so this really is the preferred way these days. We tend to build our own machines. Uh, this is my group a few years ago, building one of our recent um, versions. And we just have computers that have lots of these gaming cards inside them. And that's where we're running all of our calculations. Um, so it's pretty good. We're up to the point where running on the current generation of NVIDIA cards, we can do about a microsecond a day on a gaming card. And so there's a lot of interesting biology that happens in a microsecond. And so uh, this has changed very much in the past few years, what simulations are able to do and made it so that things like pharmaceutical companies are all doing these kinds of calculations now because they're, they're cheap enough and they don't need their own supercomputer anymore to do it. Okay, so... I showed you a little bit before about comparing dynamics. Now I have an example about comparing structure. We work really hard on these energy functions to try to get the energy right. And so this is a set of experimental structures for proteins of different sizes. 
And you can see some of them have these flat motifs that are called beta sheets. Some of them have these spirals that are helices. Some of them have both. And what we did a few years ago was said, is our current energy function, now that we can simulate long enough, you know, up to microseconds where proteins start to fold, uh, is our current energy function good enough that if we just took the sequence of these proteins and ran a simulation, would it actually get the right structure for this protein? Can you fold this protein successfully? Uh, and so this, hopefully these videos aren't too laggy, uh, hard for me to see, they look good on my local machine, but um, in, in gray in the background is the experimental structure and then we just watch in the simulation and say, well, let's just track this protein and see what it does. And um, on the computer, eventually, you can see like in this example here, uh, that it does fold and the last piece to come in is this purple helix that's gonna end up over there. And so the protein folds and when we looked at over that whole data set, we found that we could do a pretty good job and almost all of them would fold to structures that were very similar to what was known from the experiment. And so it's giving us a lot of confidence and then sometimes it doesn't work and that gives us places we need to keep improving things and this field is still really in the very early days, I think. Okay, so that's a little bit about some of the technology that we're gonna use here on this bike. For the spike, the first thing we wanted to know is about this motion here. We know from the experiments that there are likely two different states for this receptor binding domain. Um, and so the first thing we needed to do was to build out a whole model of this. This is a glycoprotein, meaning it has a protein made of amino acids, and some of those amino acids have glycans on them, which are these long branch sugar chains that are in dark blue. And those are important, very important for the protein, they're one of the things that helps it uh, avoid your immune system, but they don't show up in the experiments because they tend to be flexible. And so now we have a model um, here and the receptor binding domains are up on the top and all these dark blues are those glycans. And then I'm showing in surfaces with three colors, the three different monomers. It's got three different receptor binding domains. And so what we were able to do in our simulations is to model that change in the structure and say, okay, well, we know from the experiment that that binary domain is moving up and down, can we actually do that in the simulation and get that to happen so we know what's going on in more detail? And it does do that. Um, and so that's good, that was really our first step. Okay, what do we do with that though? We say, yes, it moves up and down, but you know, which structure does it prefer? We can't tell. And a lot of time what we wanna know from the experiments is what's the preferred structure? And how much does it prefer? What's the equilibrium between different conformations, right? Does this thing spend most of its time in the up conformation, most of its time in the down conformation, equal amounts of both? That's really hard to know from the experiment. So we're trying to model that. So I'm gonna um, show you this little model here. This is a tiny little peptide. And what I wanna do is a calculation to say, okay, this distance here that corresponds to a hydrogen bond, that's this dotted line, how often do we have that hydrogen bond in this molecule? And we don't know. And I can run a simulation and say, oh, some of the time it's there, but I want to be quantitative about this and say, how much time is this hydrogen bond there? And so one option is to run a really long simulation, run it long enough that that distance goes back and forth and back and forth many, many times. And then what I'm going to do is say, okay, this has gone back and forth enough times that it's statistically meaningful. I'm going to make a histogram of the populations, collect all my data and make a histogram. And that's this blue curve here is a histogram. That's your population. And so if you wanted to know how often or what percentage of the time it's at each different spot, this histogram will tell you that. And so that's kind of like an experiment where you're just saying, I've got a lot of molecules or I've got a long period of time and I'm gonna collect data that's gonna tell me something about what fraction is in what state. You can think about like a FRET experiment with fluorescence or an EPR experiment or NMR experiments with NOEs. There are lots of experiments that will give you things about populations of distances. Uh, but again, we don't really know from the experiment what's going on when it has that distance, so we can always look in the simulations and try to see what the structure looks like. Okay, so these histograms are very important. This is like an equilibrium constant if you've had uh, chemistry. Okay, but that's going to be really slow, and on the spike, we cannot get this to happen. So we need an alternative strategy here. We've got to do something different. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert to energy. And the populations and the energy are related. Again, if you've had uh, chemistry classes, you might remember things like that delta G is minus RT ln K. The free energy, the Gibbs free energy G, is related to the populations by a pretty simple equation. There's a natural log involved, there's the temperature involved, and then R, which is the gas constant. That's really just a unit conversion. And so we can take all those populations 
the P0 is just the most populated spot, which just sets our zero value here. And we can convert this graph to energy units. And so a lot of times we'll work in energy, but energy and population are, uh, you can convert between the two at equilibrium. Okay, so how would we get this in a complicated system like this spike? Well, there's another strategy of doing this that I'm not gonna get into all the math, but it's helpful to know that, that you can do this. It's very commonly used, it's called umbrella sampling. And so instead of one simulation that has to go back and forth in all these transitions, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that entire range of distances that we wanna sample, and we're gonna run one simulation each at lots of different distances. And so we won't have one simulation that covers everything in terms of distances, but all of the distances are covered by different simulations. And then these can all be run on different computers. And so it can be collected very quickly this way. Uh, so this is, like I said, it's highly parallel. You can run on a big computer and get all of your data at once. Uh, and for us, many simulations that are short is much easier to get than one simulation that's long because you can get more computers, but it's very hard to get faster computers. So, uh, so this calculation, we do this and then we collect some data and we do some math and convert it and that's the dark blue line. And you can see that we get out the same answer as we did before from a single lung simulation, but we've got a different way of doing it. And so that is very helpful. When we wanna know something about populations, we do this way. And then you can take these energy curves and then you can back convert it to population if you want and, and know what fraction you're gonna be in different states. Okay, so let's do that for the spike. Uh, so the spike, we want to know that receptor binding domain that I showed you open and closed. I want to know what the energy profile for that looks like. Is the upstate preferred? Is the downstate preferred? Is there a key intermediate that might be important that would be a local minimum in my surface? I don't really know. And so we're going to do the calculation. Uh, and so we've got two descriptors of the structure for our X and Y axes. They're just you know, kind of shown in these dots, but that's not really important. One is going to be this angle is about how open and closed it is, and then the other one is a dihedral angle, which just talks about rotation, whether this is kind of twisted or not. And so we took snapshots and built this grid, these black dots. The red dots are from the experiment, and we're going to say, let's map out this whole surface, the transition between the two, doing that method I showed you before. And so we run here two-dimensional, the distance one was one-dimensional. We run this two-dimensional simulation. And so we've got 176 simulations and all they do individually is explore some of that local area. And then we take all of that data and combine it all together and we get out what the free energy profile looks like. And so this free energy profile, the dark blue is the lowest free energy. That's the most stable. That would be the highest population. And so it says, well, the downstate is the most stable confirmation. This spends most of its time down, and then there's a barrier. Getting up is not so easy. You have to cross over an energy barrier. And then this one is up on this map that like green is around four, and so that's up around four kcals in energy. And that corresponds roughly about to 1%. This one, I think I hit is one and four. Yeah, so I, I guess the difference is three kcals. So that's about 1%. That means 99% of the time this thing is closed, and only 1% of the time is it actually open in that upstate, and the upstate is the one that you need in order to bind to that ACE2 receptor. And so it's nice because we didn't know this from the experiment that this thing is only in that binding capable confirmation about 1% of the time. That doesn't seem like a very good idea for the virus, right? Why would evolution have made it so that the confirmation the virus needs to be in in order to get into the cell is only there 1% of the time? Why not have it be that way all the time? Why spend 99% of your time in something where you can't even get into the cell you're trying to infect? Doesn't seem very good. Okay, so we're gonna look at that a little bit. Sorry, I, I did decide to go a little bit slower since he had me uh, with no one behind. So sorry, I'm, I'm going past my 25 minutes. Uh, this one on the left, this is our spike that's in the closed confirmation. Let me start this video over again. And so here's our receptor binding domains in the middle. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to put an ACE2 on that one in that closed state that we know is there 99% of the time. And when we try to put it there in the way that we know they should interact, it doesn't work. It overlaps, it clashes with the rest of the spike. So it can't bind to the spike when it's closed. The only way it can bind to the spike is when it's open. And so this is our model for our open state, that 1%. And now the ACE2 fits just fine. And so this will work. Okay, so it has to be open. Why is it not open all the time? That was the question that we were trying to figure out. And so this is a snapshot of that spike in that down or closed confirmation. Here, 
the blue and purple is the one that we're going to open and close, and the purple surface is the one that the ACE2 wants to bind to. And so this is one snapshot from our simulation, but when we look at lots of snapshots from the simulation, we see that those blue glycans, remember I talked about those in the beginning, those sugars on the surface, they're moving around a lot and they're keeping things from getting close. These are what's gonna block antibodies from your immune system from getting close because the antibodies also wanna to bind to that purple region just like the ACE2 does. And so these glycans move around a lot and this is why it's called a glycan shield. These glycans are here to keep your antibodies from binding to the spike because if they bind to it, they will inactivate it. And so it's gonna keep itself hidden as much as possible. 99% of the time, it's hidden from antibodies. But that also means that it can't do its job and bind to the ACE2 receptor. So 1% of the time, it's gonna open up and now that purple part that's gonna to bind to the ACE2 that also could be bound by antibodies, it's going to be outside of those glycans and so it can do its job and bind to ACE2. And so the message here is that 99% of the time it's hiding from your immune system. Even if you have antibodies, even if you've had a vaccine, 99% of the time this thing is hidden and you can't do anything about it. And every now and then, 1% of the time, it's gonna open up looking for an ACE2 and if there's not one nearby, it's gonna close again right away and stay hidden. And so it's a very difficult target to get at. Uh, so those free energy surfaces help us understand what's going on in the virus. Well, what if we wanna stop that? What if we wanna say, we don't really like the fact that you're hiding from your our immune system. We're going to keep you from closing and keep you from hiding. It's kind of like if you know that you know somebody hides in a closet or something like that and then jumps out to scare you, you just lock the closet door. So can we lock this RVD up so the immune system can get to it anytime it wants to? That would be a great thing to do. And so here, this blue one is opening right in our simulation as we map it out. And so I'm going to stop it when it's open. What we found was that there's a little bit of a hole there, this transient pocket, right? You can see a little bit of pink through that blue. That was not there in the beginning when it was closed. And so now I'm gonna zoom in to the inside of the spike into this space where it opened up. These greens here are these glycans. And so I'm gonna zoom in there and show you in a wireframe what it looks like. So you can see the molecule there. And indeed, there's a hole there. So now we're gonna close it back down again. Hopefully this isn't too laggy and you can see it. And as this closes to be in its hidden state, that pocket disappears. The little hole isn't there anymore. And so what that led us to think was, well, maybe we can find a small molecule that would fit into this spot, right? And I'm showing open and close without all the other stuff around so you can see a little better. What if we could find a molecule that would bind into that pocket? Then when it tries to close, it wouldn't be able to because we've wedged it open and now it might be really vulnerable to the immune system. And so by doing some virtual screening with Rob Rizzo's lab, I'm sure you'll hear from him in the next few weeks, we were able to identify a small molecule that's an existing molecule that you can buy that we think fits into that pocket very nicely and makes some key interactions. Uh, so that's using his program, which is called DOC, and docking is where you try to take all these small molecules and fit them into a binding pocket. So this one looks like it fits. Then we took it and we did simulations. On the left, we've got a simulation. Here's the receptor binding domain, and then this is the piece that's gonna close down on the pockets in here. This one's got nothing. This is just the regular spike wanting to be closed 99% of the time. Now here, we wedged in this purple molecule that we found through docking, and we run the simulations on these. The one without it has no problem closing, right? It, it closes most of the time, like that energy surface I showed you. And the one with this ligand bound to it, has real difficulty closing because that small molecule is there, it has really good interactions, doesn't wanna leave, and while it's bound, this RBD won't be able to close and so it's gonna keep it so that it's vulnerable. So here's the surface I showed you before where we said, well, it's only about 1% based on these energies. Now if we redo that calculation with that ligand bound, we find that it's shifted and now it's 99% exposed and only 1% buried. And so this small molecule we think can do a good job of keeping the virus from being able to hide from your immune system. Okay, I'm gonna show a little bit more um, on some of these later steps that we're trying to work on these really big conformational changes. So here in the cartoon inside the red box is the state where the spike has just bound to ACE2. And so this is um, a model that we built you know, in the group showing here is the spike with the viral membrane 
and here is the ACE2 and the host cell membrane, and they're just starting to interact. And so what we'd like to be able to do is say, okay, even if this receptor binding domain interacts with the ACE2 receptor, can we figure out what happens afterward, all of these complicated steps, so that we can learn how to stop it? Um, and so this is a bit of one of our simulations. This model actually was done with a coarse grain simulation, so we don't have all the atomic detail. Um, and it just shows you how you can model things that are in large complicated systems, where now when this uh, binding domain opens, before I had it just opening into water, but now it's gonna open and actually interact with this ACE2 receptor. And so we can get kind of a close up view of how that process happens that they can't see in the experiments. Okay, so that's about all I have time for. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them either about how simulations work and what, what we do, how they don't work, or uh, about things related to um, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2.